Welcome, folks, to The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Every week, diving deep into the truth of Catholic social teaching and restoring all things in Christ. The Uncommon Good is on the air. I'm Bo Bonner. I'm Dr. Bud Marr. We're coming to you from these United States of America, here in the middle of the country, in the middle of Iowa, Des Moines Diocese. Iowa Catholic Radio. Thank you for listening to the show. I am Bo Bonner. I am the Senior Advisor for Mission Initiatives over at Mercy College of Health Sciences. Bud, what do you do at the old school? I'm the Associate Provost at Mercy College, so work with our program chairs to make sure that our students get first-rate education. And we want to say thank you to Mercy College of Health Sciences, who underwrites our show, mchs.edu. Uh, the students, I mean, that's what we're there for, uh, to not only... Um, carry forth the mission, the spirit, the charism of the Sisters of Mercy, but but in a world that needs a lot of healing, uh, we're hoping that we can be part of um, that healing ministry, that extension of Jesus's healing uh, to the communities that our students, once they graduate, uh, go out and help people out. So if you're interested in a career of that ministry of healing, mchs.edu is a place you might want to check out. Yeah, I was talking to some of our clinical instructors this week, Bo, and in all seriousness, like just like one really neat piece. I know neat is kind of like an adjective that doesn't have. So one one awesome thing about being at Mercy is like when we talk about our mission and legacy and we talk about Sister Catherine McCauley, you know, I think some colleges like the history is sort of fossilized. Like it's something like the statues are there and it's on the website, but maybe it doesn't impinge on the day to day a lot. I think in our role and we've we've talked to a lot of different groups about this, you know, really our instructors are in a very similar place to where Catherine McCauley was, where uh, Sister McCauley, you know, she inherited, um, she she received a great inheritance from a couple that she had been a maid servant for, and then she took those funds and started the House of Mercy in one of the poorest parts of Ireland, and then spent the rest of her life, uh, you know, feeding the hungry, providing shelter to folks, giving um, women and children on the margins education. And, you know, like in America today, when you look across the landscape, we're hurting for nurses and healthcare professionals so badly. A lot of the students that come to the college, they may have children, you know, single parents taking care of aging relatives themselves. And so, you know, what a high calling. And this is the vision I was trying to cast for the clinical instructors to, you know, what a high, what a high calling to serve that group and to help folks like to transform their lives by giving them this meaningful career where it's not only like, a well-paying job, but also like a great service to our community in the world. So absolutely. One more time. Mercy College underwrites our show, mchs.edu, and exactly how Bud says. Well, Bud, and I actually think yeah. um, overlap, just to bring up with what we're talking about on today's show, um, Intervisions Healthcare, so um, a wonderful nonprofit here in Iowa, so Unplanned Pregnancy and SED Medical Clinics, um, that does such a great service for the community, a lot of uh, you know overlap with what we try to do. And um, we might have more uh, InterVision listeners, perhaps some of the first-time listeners, so we're glad to have you with us. We're going to have, uh, for the first 20 minutes of the show, we're going to have an interview with the guest speaker. Um, so it's Dr. William uh, Lyle, uh, who is uh, the pro-life doc, and ha- he's down in Florida. He does all sorts of uh, wonderful things for yeah. the pro-life movement, but particularly um, he has that on the ground medical knowledge about uh, what it takes, what it means uh, to be pro-life on the ground, um, helping those kids out. And uh, I would have to say, Bud, maybe it should be fair warning for <laughs> InterVision uh, folks, if this is the first time listening to our show. Uh, I would have to say we're not like the most typical interview on earth. How would you uh, th- describe very shortly how our interviews usually go? Well, actually, when, when I taught, I'm a big planner, so I would want every bullet point of the lecture like spelled out. And when I co-taught with Bo, I'd come into the room and he would almost be resistant to see the lecture notes because it sort of like takes potentially some of the air out of the room. So jumping into interviews, we're sort of the same way. We found that like the creative juices really flow and the energy is high. If we just like have, have a brief introduction with the speaker and then see kind of where the conversation takes us. But I'm excited about today's interview. I was able to do some research beforehand. I think folks are really going to enjoy listening to Dr. Lyle and the great work he's doing in Florida. Yep. We, uh, we plan to, be clicking on the same cylinders we always do, bud. <laughs> so I'm thinking you'll uh, you'll you'll at least have a good time. I know that we will have a wide ranging conversation, but hopefully uh, that does two things. On one hand, it means you won't hear what he's going to end up talking about. So hopefully it's a good preview for you to go then listen to you know whatever yeah. uh, the talk ends up being. Uh, but also I hope that uh, we also in the second half can maybe 
tease out some of these things about um, what it means uh, for uh, the pro-life movement to think about Catholic social teaching in general. So this is The Uncommon Good, Bob Honor and Dr. Bud Marr. Stick around. We'll be back right after this. We're back with the Uncommon Good. Bob Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show, whether that is on Iowa Catholic Radio's, of course, live broadcast on all of its stations, iowacatholicradio.com live, the Iowa Catholic Radio app, or our faithful podcast listeners. We are happy to have you with us. Today on the show, we are going to have the guest speaker for the 2023 Intervisions Annual Gala, which will be Thursday, June 1st. So with us on the show, we have Dr. William Lyle. Uh, he has always had a passion for educating about the personhood of the unborn. His expertise in the medical field, coupled with bold, his bold faith, has informed his entire career. And as a medical professional, he understands the importance of the life-affirming work that Intervisions does in empowering women and saving babies. Bill, thank you for joining the show. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much, and we're looking forward to being up with you on June 1st. Fantastic. So just as an introduction for the folks who are listening out there, if you don't mind giving a little bit of your background and how you got into uh, the work in, in a sufficient enough manner that people are asking you to go around the country talking about it. Well, I'm board certified in obstetrics and gynecology. I'm licensed to practice medicine in Florida and Alabama. And in 1999, when I finished my residency at the University of Florida, the practice that I took over was actually the largest provider of abortions here in the Florida panhandle. Uh, we took over the practice. We had him sign a restrictive covenant, and on day one, we stopped all abortions and all abortion referrals. And we thought that was pretty much where our job finished. But then we went. I went upstairs on a Sunday after church and actually toured the abortion uh, surgical site upstairs. And I thought, my goodness, how has this been going on in this town for decades with churches with thousands of members, Pensacola Christian College on the same road. So we did a presentation at my church because I have spent my life learning how to save the lives of not only the moms, but the babies in the womb. And we treat them as patients. And, you know, thousands of abortions had been done in this center, no protesters. So uh, we just dedicated up my career that uh, we were going to do everything we could to save the lives of God's preborn in the womb. Bill, this is Bud Marr. Thanks for coming on. Um, I'm curious to hear about your experience in medical school and whether or not, you know, like what sort of conversations you had in that context. And the reason I ask is for myself, you know, one of the most challenging parts of, of being dedicated to the pro-life movement is how do you have those conversations with family members or neighbors or whoever who might be in a very different place, you know, and, and really uh, with some of the social assumptions that are popular or things that even people learn in schools, you know, a, a lot of the things that maybe we take for granted, like foundational convictions, aren't common ground necessarily entering in those conversations. I'm sure, you know, you had uh, debates or challenging conversations when you're in medical school. Oh, always. And w one of the things to really focus on is who your audience is and what their values are. You can't use Genesis 126 with somebody who doesn't look at Scripture as an authoritative source. But what can you appeal to? You can t appeal to their sense of right and wrong and also patients' rights. One of the, the first thing that we learn in medical school is a Latin term, prima non seri, which is, first of all, do no harm. And then the second thing that we're taught in medical school is that a patient is a person is entitled to respect and bodily integrity. Everybody would agree that these are good core values and good foundations to build on. So then we use science, something that they have studied all their lives, especially when you're a physician in medical school, and you talk about patients' rights, but then you talk about the advancing ways that we are now treating babies in the womb as a patient. And a patient is a person, no matter how small. There are just new examples, even video, of how we are treating the preborn as patients in the womb that are coming out every couple weeks. I mean, even just last week, there was actually a brain surgery that was done on a baby at 34 weeks gestation that had a vascular abnormality called a Galen malformation. And before the baby was born, while the baby was still in the womb, in the uterus, they actually went in and they fixed this Galen malformation, this vascular blood vessel abnormality in the baby's brain. Because when these babies are born and they have this malformation, 
Half of them don't do well, and of that half that don't do well, half of them die. If we can fix it before the baby is born, they do beautifully. But we are now removing tumors from babies' hearts. They're getting Babies are getting their own anesthesiologists. We're routinely doing blood transfusions to babies in the womb, laser vascular surgery. If they are a patient, they are a person. And if they are a person, then they have rights and we need to respect them. And the visuals, not just of an ultrasound, but we're actually putting cameras inside of the womb, little GoPros that you can see and not only diagnose, but you can cure. And all of our patients have rights no matter how small and what their geographic location happens to be. Bud and I have had the chance to teach um, bioethics uh, in in our past. We do a lot of administration now, which is in some ways the opposite of bioethics, Bud. (laughs) Um, But one of the things that we found would give people pause who come to our class, even at a Catholic school, most of them not predisposed uh, to hear out, so as you were, as it were, the pro-life ethics. When we talk about the precautionary principle, that medicine, um, one of the things that it wants to do, as you said, in the do no harm, when you extrapolate that to say we're not going to jump to conclusions, especially on the way back, as it were, to you know the beginnings of life. Um, but we, there's all sorts of ways in which we don't try to push the extent of science just because it's capable of doing so. So if the precautionary principle tells us that the reverence of life is to give it the benefit of the doubt, if you match that up with what you're pointing out, the sort of um, forward-thinking way in which the technology of medicine allows us to actually treat as patients those people who are in the womb, I think that that starts to make a much stronger case than is sometimes popularly uh, narrated, um, you know, in the press, as it were. Oh, absolutely. And we can even go further back when it comes to how we treat them as a patient. There is a one of the most popular forms of growing parties is a gender reveal party where everybody wants to have a party and celebrate whether they're having a boy or a girl, which is a lot of fun. And it used to be we had to do it with the ultrasound, where we can actually see the genitalia and look at it with the ultrasound. That's a boy or that's a girl. And maybe you could see it at 16 weeks, maybe at 17 weeks. Now we can do a simple blood test that is available at every OB's office called a panorama. And this simple blood test drawn from the arm of the mother actually can look for little fragments of the baby's DNA. And with more than 99% accuracy, I can tell you if not if that's going to be a boy or a girl, but that is a boy or a girl. We can do this test seven weeks after conception. I mean, we've only been able to see the heart beating for a couple of weeks, and yet Two weeks later, we can actually say, this is a boy, this is a girl, and celebrate and have a party celebrating this new son or daughter. So we can continue to go back. And even as far as we do blood transfusions, but why do we do blood transfusions to save lives of babies in the womb? Because from the moment of conception, that genetic person there at that first cell is genetically unique from the mom, genetically unique from the dad, And they can even have not only different uh, genders, but they can actually have different blood types. And one of the reasons that we will give babies blood transfusions is because mom will have a different blood type than the baby, and she will actually have antibodies in her blood which are attacking the blood of the baby. And we can see that on that first initial set of labs. Well, when we see that the baby is being attacked by the mother because it has a different blood type, We do further testing, and if the baby is anemic, just like if you got a real bad laceration and you were anemic, then we would give you a life-saving blood transfusion. So if you happen to have O-negative blood and you went to the Red Cross, you donated your blood, we could use your blood to transfuse and save the life of a baby. We've done that at my hospital as early as 18 weeks gestation. But as far as doing studies and genetically seeing that this is a person that is different from mom, dad, and the other 7 billion people on the planet, we can do that right from the moment of conception. And that we know that that is a different person. Bill, and hearing your story, it, it sounds like you were pro-life early on. You know, like it wasn't necessarily like a dramatic conversion during your studies, but something that was, you know, a key part of your worldview from a, a, a fairly young age. Um, I'm sure you, you know, you, of course, probably have patients who, who land at your door who are in a different place. Do you find that for, say, like an expecting mother to – with some of the technology we, we have now, it's so amazing to be able to 
see and perceive the child there. I, I'm sure that's uh, the first time um, moms see that it can be it can be life changing. Oh, ultrasound is an amazing tool, and yes, we don't have pro life, you know, Jesus loving patients that come into our office on a regular basis. I mean, but we show them that this is life on the inside, and if this is a, a pregnancy that has surp- surprised them, and they're even contemplating abortion, first we celebrate with them and say congratulations. We show them this life. Listen to the heartbeat. We celebrate with them. But if they are thinking about the pressures that they are experiencing, we need to meet those those uh, pressures and figure out what their concerns are. If they're concerned about their health, if they're concerned about where am I going to live, where am I, what's the baby daddy going to say? The pregnancy resource centers around the country and the pro-life groups are there to meet those needs. If you don't think you have the resources, we're going to meet that need. If you think that you don't have health care and you don't have a place to live, we're going to meet those concerns. We're going to celebrate that life. But it's our job, our goal to meet those needs, to take the things that are scaring you. Because literally with those first ultrasounds, we are saving the life of somebody. And we're here to meet those needs, not to threaten or scare, but to just help. Well, I think that that's an interesting way to, to even talk about the strides we've made understanding interpersonality even of adults that if we start talking about the well-being and psychologically it makes a lot of sense we talk about the 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 interpersonal way in which who we are psychologically is manifested by dependencies on other people um, and interrelationships but that we're starting to see from something as basic as mirror neurons to actual affectation biologically that we are more than just the sort of integrity of our body our bodies are healthy in league with other bodies at the adult level and as we discover this and this becomes more prominent it seems to me um, in medicine in general you have an inroad to work back as you as you're as we're working at to, to answer what I think sometimes people act like that the pro-life movement is trying to make an adversarial um, an adversarial relationship between the baby and the mother and it chooses the baby uh, to the detriment of the mother every time but as an OBGYN I would assume that what you get to see day in and day out is actually how it is that the relationship between a mom and the baby at root can't be adversarial. And this this worldview is actually probably playing into the the worries people have about mothers getting sick or having complications in and after pregnancy. If we if we begin to understand the relationship and how basic it is about personhood in relationship to other people, um, we won't talk about that relationship, the foundational one between mom and baby in such adversarial ways. And I'm guessing you see that on a biophysical level every day. Oh, we do. And we see it and we recognize it and we support it. And we are there to meet the needs of the moms. I mean, whenever I have a pregnant mom come into my office, I have two patients. I have the mom and I have the baby. And we have fields of medicine where people have dedicated their lives to have healthy moms and healthy babies. We just sent, spent $70 million for our new pediatric and women's hospital with the goal of we want healthy moms and healthy babies. People spend four years in college, four years in medical school, four years in residency, then three years in a fellowship in maternal fetal medicine just to have healthy moms and healthy babies. So it is a field of medicine. It is a blessing. And we just want to give people the information because we don't want they, them to make decisions that they regret. You've probably seen the study where, you know, suicides over on the Golden Gate Bridge and, you know, probably 2,000 people have jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and committed suicide. Well, a psychologist realized that 29 of those people who walked out onto the bridge thinking nobody loves me, nobody cares for me, there's no reason for me to continue on, I'm going to jump off the bridge. Well, 29 people actually survived when they jumped off the bridge. And so the psychologist tracked them down, interviewed them and said, what was going through your mind when they walked out onto the bridge? And they all said the same thing. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares for me. Nobody's here to meet my needs. Then she asked, what was going through your mind after you jumped off the bridge? 29 of 29 said categorically they immediately had regrets, and they cried out. They didn't want to die. And by some miracle, they were either 
fish down the water by the Coast Guard or fishermen or they swam to shore. I think that's the same thing with abortion. At that moment, people are just scared to death. What am I going to do? Who's going to help meet my needs? Who's going to support me? And they make a decision. But it's amazing how many of them have regrets. And even with the abortion pill, we can reverse the effect of the abortion pill safely. I've attempted that 17 times. I've been successful 13 out of those 17 times. Two of those calls that I received where moms had profound regrets actually came from the parking lot of the abortion clinic, where in just that short amount of time, they hadn't started their car up. They said, what did I do? So we're here to help them, to educate them, to let them see the gift that they have that's on the inside, because this is an amazing gift that'll be with them and be a best friend and someone to love for the rest of their lives. Going in a little bit different direction, Bill, we're coming up on the one year anniversary of the Supreme Court Dobbs decision. And I'm, I'm curious to know, like, how has that changed the landscape for, um, f- for the practice in America or in, in Florida, or are we still sort of waiting to see how that settles? Well, you know, yes, we celebrate when Roe versus Wade was reversed after being the law of the land for 49 years, and it went back to the care of the states. Now, have some states gone in a wonderful direction? Absolutely. I mean, two years ago, the gestational age cap for abortion was 24 weeks. Then we worked with the legislature and with public circles and testimony, and we dropped that to 15 weeks. Last month, I spoke before members of the House and the Senate, Tallahassee, Florida, and The House voted that night to drop it to heartbeat. Two weeks later, the Senate voted, and then Governor Ron DeSantis signed it into law that night. That is a huge change in just two years. But then we see states where there is no gestational age cap, where millions of dollars are spent to abort a baby at any gestational age. And when you look at the maps, and I just put these together for our talk um, coming up in a couple of weeks, When you look at the maps of the United States of states that are pro-life and states that are pro-abortion, and you compare those maps with different colored states to where we were back in the 1860s, it's amazing how they map out. If slavery was wrong in New Jersey in the 1860s, then slavery was inherently wrong and evil in Mississippi as well. Didn't matter if there was a geographic line. Now, if abortion is wrong and immoral and evil in Mississippi, then abortion is wrong and immoral and evil in New Jersey as well. So in the 1860s, we went to a civil war over a lot of these issues. We don't want to go to war. I think the real key is letting people know that these are patients on the inside. They are not blobs of tissue, and especially with the younger generation that is dealing with this personally. They are such great learners and visual learners. So we can show them these babies, show them moving, not only that they're moving and that they're alive, but we can diagnose when there's something that's abnormal and we can treat and cure it. Then that is a patient and that and patients have rights. Well, folks, you've been listening to a preview of Dr. William uh, Lilly uh, or Lyle, excuse me, sorry, Dr. William Lyle, um, who will be the guest speaker at the InterVisions Healthcare Gala, which is Thursday, June 1st. And you can go to InterVisions uh, Healthcare to look up about how you can uh, support, of course, what's going on here. But that was just a small preview of what's going on. And we really appreciated uh, that, that he was able to join us. But, um, Bill, before you go, yes, people should go, especially if they're in Iowa, to the June 1st on Thursday, the InterVisions Gala, uh, where you will be speaking. But if people want to uh, learn more about uh, you, uh, your your ministry, your, your your what you do in healthcare, where can they go uh, find more of your work? Sure. Our ministry source is prolifedoc.org, but we're also on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. You can just binge watch the heck out of all the educational material we put up. And if you think that the things we were talking about were interesting, wait until you see the 3D animations and the visuals of surgery and how we save the lives of babies in the womb. And we'll be doing that in two weeks. That's fantastic. And again, one more time, InterVisions Healthcare Gala, Thursday, June 1st. Our guest speaker who we had the chance to talk with today is Dr. William Lyle, the pro-life doc. You can go visit him at his website there. You can go to InterVisions, uh, to their website, to figure out all you need to to make sure to be able to see him live. Uh, Bill, thank you so much for being on the show. It was a pleasure to have you. Oh, it's an honor. And we are going to have fun in two weeks. 
This is The Uncommon Good with uh, Bo Bonner, Dr. Bud Mars. Stick around. We'll be back right after this. Back with The Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner, Dr. Bud Marr. Thank you for listening to the show, especially thank you for all of you who may be first-time listeners uh, associated with InterVisions. We're glad to have you with us. I hope you enjoyed that interview. But we usually have a pretty high-flying energy show. Um, but I have to say someone uh, like Dr. Uh, William Lyle, who does all that work medically and then can have uh, – was, was I would I don't know sprint a drag race uh, of a twenty minute interview where we talked about so much wonderful to have him on the show. Yeah, you know I get around some persons and I I feel like I'm a decent energy person, but then I feel low energy maybe in the presence of someone like Dr. Lyle. So great to have him on. I thought it was actually like a nice uh, was it last episode they they kind of blur together for me sometimes where we talked about evangelism and yep. kind of redeeming language. And I think in this area when we think about the, the pro-life movement, there's so much opportunity here. So our culture, to me, Bo, and uh, maybe you don't see it 100% this way, but it seems like there's a concern in a lot of areas about justice. And so uh, even those outside the church, like we, there's a lot of conversation on the news about um, the justice of certain causes or injustices. You know, with, with social media and with television media, we know so much about what's happening around the world than people did even like a century ago. And yet in the midst of those conversations, I think one thing that's kind of lacking, and we saw this, you mentioned that we taught bioethics together. I think a lot of young people who've got uh, a a passion for justice, they maybe lack in anthropology. So anthropology has to do with the study of the human being and what does it mean to be human? And to me, this is a real opportunity because the Catholic faith, the Catholic intellectual tradition has thought about this for two millennia and there's so many resources going back to St. Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, uh, and then up to today with the the last like century and a quarter, the church has really developed this whole tradition of, of Catholic social teaching in light of some of the dramatic changes that were happening, like with the industrialization of our society. And that, you know, it's such rich treasure. Part of the inspiration for the show in the very beginning is like you and I had had a lot of conversation about this with students. And we were like, you know, this needs to be more in the water in the Catholic sphere. And so that's that's part of the original inspiration of the show. Great to have someone on like Dr. Lyle. I, I hope many of our listeners can get out to the gala. It sounds like it's going to be a great event. And one more time, that is on uh, Thursday, June 1st. And if you go to InterVision's website, I think that's the best way to figure out how you can go there and hear, um, you know, the, the talk itself. But I think justice is precisely something that, of course, we always need to come back to. It's easy to imagine that justice is just a matter of punishing people who do wrong, or maybe it's something about laws, you know, in a vague way. Um, but justice is a very basic idea that we should give each thing its due. What is due to it? And, it, of course, we think of persons, um, we think of God, we think of humans. But there's a way in which the most basic, I mean, you can give justice to an inanimate object, right? What What is it? Uh, what what do you owe it? You know, and that might can sound strange, except when you start to allow that to pervade deeply how you look at the world, we start to see that justice is not um, a formal matter alone. Um, it's not just a matter of record keeping or you know rectifying books. It's certainly not an atomistic thing where there's just um, individuals floating in space and justice is about you know click you know checking the right box on their behalf. Justice starts to be this deep vision about how we all belong together and that that's what we start to mean that giving each one what they are due is a way to say, how do I live in a relationship, a loving relationship with first God, but then his creatures. And so I think you're absolutely right to say again and again, we've seen young people increasingly worried precisely about a world with very fractured relationships. So it it's no wonder to me that what bubbles up, in their concerns is justice. And of course, yet the young are like sponges. They suck up the sort of moisture of whatever theory that they run into. And so on one hand, we should never be completely surprised that maybe they get, uh, they, they have this desire for justice and then they sort of um, sign on to whatever they hear first or whatever's most prevalent. But that's just to say that Christians in general, the Catholics, you know, uh, who are listening to Iowa Catholic radio, specifically, that it's our job to be a witness to that full tradition of social justice that you talked about, Bud. And notice that I said witness. It's not that we need to be scholars or you know legalists in the sort of way 
that we're just going to be dropping, you know, truth bombs about the law to folks. The best way to show that you care about justice is, once again, to give each their due. And that's not just being nice or kind of, you know, learning to go along to get along or, you know, wiping your nose and paying your taxes. It is a deep-seated idea that um, in gratitude for God creating us and us living in right relationship to him, that we would extend that same sort of... Of, of justice and mercy, which is related to those around us whose lives God has put us in. Well, I think uh, for those of us who have uh, are able to carve out the time, it's great to try to dive into what the church has written about these topics. I think when you think about the pro-life movement and really take some time to reflect on an encyclical like John Paul II's Evangelium Vitae, it's challenging for all of us. So we've already mentioned the dynamic in our society about young people are uh, in public discourse, this concern for justice, but maybe the, the conversation is there without all of the tools that as Catholics we would want to see be a part of the conversation. And then in the church, I think in the American Catholic Church, there's been a real concern and kind of a, an, an attempt to recover the importance of the family as the basic building block of society and a concern from life. You know, you sometimes hear in the prayers of the faithful from conception until natural death, you know? And th- so I think uh, the, for mass goers, like those commitments are a common piece that Catholics bring to the table. On the flip side are like a, a third dynamic that I would mention that maybe uh, I'll, I'll shine the light on myself and say like something that I've had to try to grow into and think more about is John Paul II pointed out that the way we sometimes structure our econ- economic life and think about um, economics or politics can leave folks out on the margins, even like extending beyond the unborn child. And Pope Francis, you know, he's kind of prone to like pithy statements that capture these ideas. He says like so often the way that we structure our politics and our economics, we end up like leaning into a throwaway culture. So if someone can't contribute to, to the economy or to like the bottom line, they're less valued or sometimes even sort of discarded. We think about maybe the way that we treat our elderly in contrast to the way that those uh, persons were revered in other previous cultures or whatnot. And so, again, the pro-life movement, it's great to have Dr. Lyle on the show and for him to shine a light and to speak boldly about the way that as Catholics we have to be committed to those who are still in the womb. And then for myself, for the rest of us, thinking about, like, are there other ways we've structured our communal life that, you know, we, we sort of, like, inadvertently um, like fall into this kind of throwaway culture that, that the Holy Father has criticized. I think it's interesting to, I know I brought this up with him, but to return to it, we start to see in secular medicine, secular psychology, people understanding finally how individuals are not individuals on their own. And it's very obvious why certain forces in history want you to be an unattached individual. On one hand, it makes it easier for you to up and move and get this job so you can consume these things, right? And But also, right, then you don't have these thick relationships with things like your parents or your church or, you know, friends in a sort of similar way. Those things are passing and you're willing to move away from them uh, to live a certain sort of economic life, like you said. So how do you make yourself feel okay? How do you get emotional homeostasis in these sort of like big words they have? And so you, you buy things, you get addicted to things, you comfort yourself it starts to make a lot of sense why we have this individual fragmentation, but then it also then subsequently, bud, makes understanding that we can be so affluent in our world and so unhappy um, because we're missing those things that make uh, make us who we are, which is not just this sort of individual out on a ledge on their own, but a deep web of connections that make us who we are. So Secular medicine, I think, is getting better at this. Certainly psychology is, but I think you start to see people talking about things like, even as basic, but that some people are like, you know, your brain really is not just like the gray matter in your head, but in some way your brain is the neurons that extend into your stomach, and we hear about the gut-brain pathway, all of these things in medicine that start to say we're very much more interconnected than we are just an amalgam of parts, and that has to do with us on a personal level as well. So, But I think that if we combine what we said, the sort of, yearning for justice that the young feel, the fragmentation that they're facing, the thing to throw out is if we're worried about a world that fundamentally fragments us as individuals and blows asunder 
the deep way we need to be interpersonally connected, then it really is the case that the sort of fulcrum of this bud is the mother versus the child or the mother with the child. And so if you make an entire economic and medical order where people go in thinking, ah, I need to not have this child because, and then they give all of the reasons they do, which, but they are pressing concerns. It's like Dr. Lyle said, people are afraid because we have ordered society to make them afraid. And the, the fact that the, the shining beacon on who we are as a society is that people feel like this adversarial us versus them, but it starts with mothers with their children before the child's even born. Yeah. And so sometimes we act like things are, you know, uh, that if we can just attend to those, everything else will resolve. But I really think that the matter of pro, pro-life and like the, the, the whole horror of abortion is a beacon about what's fundamentally wrong in our society. If we can't get this right, if we can't make mothers feel like I can love my child where they're most intimately connected with me in the womb, we have no chance with any of these other questions either. Well, I like how you point out the way that our health and our well-being is connected to in, in relationship to those around us. The way that John Paul II sort of talked about this was to say, that the common good just can't be a matter of like sort of adding up the desires or even like the like questions of individual justice. It's not just sort of like a combination of all those persons. It's just not an aggregate of these of things. those things. Yeah. It's really like a consideration of of the whole of society, you know. And I think Bo, that that's where again, like as we're having this conversation today, I just think about like the real gift that the Catholic Church has to offer. Uh, those who are sort of like the walking wounded in our society, you know, even something like the teaching against the use of contraception, a very controversial, sometimes like very foreign to those outside the church. It really, like we have so many lonely individuals in our society. Um, in mid century, there was a, a theologian, uh, Henri de Lubac, who wrote a book, Catholicism and the common destiny of man. And one of the key threads in that book is that none of us is saved alone. And sometimes when I first talk about this idea with like committed Catholics, it kind of runs against the grain of our sensibilities because we're like, my salvation, like, of course, that has to be like front and center of my own mind. I I have this responsibility before God because one day I'll be judged. All true, yet the salvation that like you're sort of being called into, it inevitably or like by its very nature involves relationship. We have so many lonely individuals in our society because our families are smaller and sometimes we've turned on children in the womb, um, and they're being called into community, into the mystical body of Christ. And that's where even even like the Eucharist, it's it's salvific. Like it, it is relationship with God, but that relationship with God is only known through that community that you've been called into. And so like evangelism, going back to last week somewhat, it's not sort of like a sales pitch that we have to give. It's an invitation to a wedding feast where people will find the answers to the questions that are causing some of the consternation in their own lives. Yeah, I think so much of the reaction people feel when they get into that lonely state, as you're saying, but and people can be profoundly lonely around a lot of people. Yeah, so what, yeah. what we're not trying to say is like, oh, the problem is everyone lives in a desert. Well, you know, of mm-hmm. course, we go, what are you talking about, guys? Everybody's moving to these big metropolises. Everyone's around each other all the time. You can connect, you know, through your phone, you know, social media. But there's something fundamental about loneliness that is not just mere proximity. Um, You can feel the most alone in a crowd as sort of a a trope of, you know, poetry and music. It's a fundamental idea that I think starts with unconscious signals, bud. And so if there's an idea that you were born into a society where your mom, by complete legitimacy of law, could have killed you, and that be considered legal. I don't think people go around sitting around going, oh, my mom could have aborted me. But I will make the, the bold claim that there's an unconscious anxiety at the root of modern civilization, bud, that in a, in a way that very rarely existed in other places, it's not completely true. People would bring up the Roman Empire, but then I would bring back this is precisely why Christianity had so much traction in it. But any society that ultimately says, yeah, you really could have been offed before you even were born. Or like you could have been um, exposed to the elements the day you were born. And society not only would go like, ah, man, you know, you win some, you lose some. Society goes, 
that is not only legal, but we're going to make a big deal that it's supposedly a right that you have. But psychologically, at a, at a social level, that is a level of anxiety that I do not think we confront the reality of and about how much it lends to this fragmentary loneliness that people can feel in the midst of tons of people. Well, yeah, and in, in, a, in a show today where we're talking about pro-life topics in light of what you're just saying about that social anxiety kind of created by the way that we structure our communities, like I turn also to like euthanasia or physician assisted suicide, where in a lot of places, other countries, um, even states in our own country, it starts off as kind of um, seen as something merciful for those who are maybe suffering from a terminal illness where there's great pain. But the philosophical assumptions undergirding that movement are that um, a dignified death is something that's kind of like autonomously chosen when you realize like life doesn't have the same meaning that it used to, or you don't have the same capacities that you used to. And that, you know, like in ethics, we talk about the slippery slope. This is one place where we've definitely seen a slippery slope, because if you take those ideas to their natural conclusion, you know, then we begin to ask like, well, what if I'm seriously depressed or, you know, like I've got a condition that I may live another few decades, but it, it, in a sense, it's terminal. It's not going away. And f- even for those of us who are like relatively healthy, <laughs> uh, you know, I say Very relatively, relatively, re- relatively for right myself <laughs> or like, you know, like we, we do have like a loving family, a, me- a meaningful job and things like this. It does. It sort of like it, um, it corrodes the kind of social web that we're supposed to have because we know in the back of our minds, well, if I have a debilitating accident, say like I'm driving home, have a car wreck and tomorrow I can no longer walk and contribute to society like I used to, will I be valued in the same way? And so as Catholics, like our message today truly is countercultural. We're, we're giving people like a different way to, to live in the world, to even think about the dignity of each person, regardless of their intellectual capacities, their physical abilities, the amount of money they make, and so on. Yeah, I'm I'm shouting out to uh, a Twitter friend I have, Punky Mantia, uh, who you know she she's had she had cancer. She's a cancer survivor, but I've seen her speak eloquently about this. Where there has been people, even within the church, who claiming that they're trying to be merciful when they advocate for laxity in terms of euthanasia, that she points out that they don't realize the implied cruelty that they are saying to people in the midst of those struggles. Um, I think of, of course, the great philosopher that uh, I will always advocate uh, for people to, if not read, at least, you know, digest in some way his ideas. But Alistair McIntyre's great book, Dependent Rational Animals, it is a completely different world to say that there's a group that believes our dependence and our interdependence is not a weakness, but actually the, the fountain of our strength. And so when you say we will expend even maybe exorbitant resources to try to be there for people who are suffering, like you said, through disease, illness, even terminal ones, and let us back up to say that this is very different than the sort of um, futurism and like sort of techno- technocratic uh, pride that goes like, I, we will be gods and we'll heal all things. That's not what we're even saying. But that people who are currently going through debilitating terminal illnesses that we go, we won't give up on you, and we will never imagine that one of the the cost-saving measures of having society is to even make you think for a second, we want you to use um, euthanasia. This is what is happening in Canada. And, I mean, I try very much not to, like, be alarmist about these things, but, but, but as we've pointed out, it doesn't have to be some sort of villain from, like, a futuristic movie. These are people who think that they're doing this for merciful reasons, which is all the more reason we have to double down to, like you said, speak about justice and the fact, as the scripture says, justice and mercy will kiss. They are intertwined in a way that can never be separated. Well, and another powerful element of this whole worldview is it transforms the ordinary experience of everyday life. I think so many people were drawn to the little way of St. Therese in large part because they recognize like her path is the path of so many of us. Maybe we will be called to something heroic that will be remembered historically. But for each one of us to change a diaper, to spend time with someone with a disability, to feed our aging parents, those moments are transformed into 
what seems like ordinary experiences to things that have great eternal magnitude. So a high calling indeed. So I, I hope that some of you maybe have heard us for the whole, for the first time that, uh, Maybe going a bit deeper helps you see how we see this all threaded with the interview we just had. Um, if this is the last time you're hearing us, hopefully something sticks. But we're glad to have you with us. And we do hope that you visit InterVision's uh, website, the InterVision Healthcare Gala, Thursday, June 1st. Guest speaker, Dr. William Lyle. Uh, it was a wonderful um, interview, but wonderful show. I hope people take advantage of it. Yep, take care. This is The Uncommon Good. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> We're back with the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show. Bud, I hope people enjoy this podcast, especially people who uh, maybe are listening to us uh, for the first time uh, who are uh, supporters of InterVision. Hopefully you'll listen to us again. Hopefully you don't, you know, haven't already blocked us. And the reason why, I hope, <laughs> is because we have another special guest. Bud, this might be the first time, maybe the second time that we've had two guests in one show. But this guy... He's hardly even a guest. He's like a brother. Why don't you introduce who we're going to throw on the show here at the end real quick, bud? Well, so we have on the air now Brian Gonzalez. Brian, I don't know if I know your official title, title at Intervisions. I want to say Director of Development. Commandant. But you, Commander. You and I are, are members of the same Eucharistic community. <laughs> and uh, you're, also, you're also next door to us at the radio station. So Intervisions, their West office is right next door, but the, the gala is coming up. That's the big thing we want to talk about this morning. Could you remind folks when it is and what's going on? Yeah. Thanks for having me on guys. That, that was a, a pretty powerful interview with Dr. Lyle. And um, so yeah, InterVisions Healthcare, we're a free clinic here in West Des Moines, We've been around for 12 years. Um, since we're a free nonprofit, the gala serves as our main fundraiser of the year. And so that's why we're, we do that every year. And um, Dr. Lyle bringing in a, a medical doctor to be able to talk about, um, you know, the theme this year is the, 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 the miracle of a heartbeat. And so obviously as a physician, he's done thousands of ultrasounds and delivered thousands of babies. And so we're really excited for him to be able to share his message to our audience. Yeah. So um, we've been had the chance to go to several of uh, InterVisions and, you know, probably been a net loss for you guys. Bud and I uh, eating, you know, <laughs> a what, second helping of chicken. Yeah, cordon right. Blue. But I'm hoping that <laughs> we're repaying some of the debt now. No. Um, can you just tell people, you know, for something like a nonprofit like InterVisions, I mean, a gala, you go have a fun night, you know, it's a way that we raise money. But this is something that's very important to make sure the good work that you do continues. So so very briefly, can you just connect it for people why it is that if you, you sign up, you go to the gala, that you are making a difference on the ground through InterVisions? Yeah, so while we're talking, if folks want to visit IVHcare.org, so IVHcare.org, click on the link for the gala and they can uh, get more information there. Um, and then a quick shout out to you all. Uh, Mercy College of Health Science has been a sponsor for the gala the last couple of years. And so very grateful for, for your place of employment to support InterVision. Um, and that sort of demonstrates the, the we, we don't charge our patients anything to come for our free services. We don't receive state and federal grant money and we don't take insurance. So we are truly an independent clinic with no revenue. What a great business model. Uh, and so that's why we're a nonprofit. Uh, and, and, and so in order to fund all of our free programs and services, uh, we, we have this opportunity for people to come, uh, 11 or 1200 people is, is kind of what we're hoping for on June 1st down at the Iowa event center. Um, and then, you know, sort of, you know, Dr. Lyle's message is really, uh, educational, inspirational. Uh, we hope people walk away from that with a sense of, um, commitment to, um, not just the pro-life mission in general, but really, the, what, what our mission at InterVision is, is to empower women and to save babies. We know that um, in order for the, the life of the baby to be saved, we need to provide for the needs of the mother. And that providing for that mom is, looks different. But as a medical clinic, we're, we're approaching it from a medical standpoint. Well, we appreciate you being able to come uh, onto the show and put, point out so succinctly uh, what it is that you guys do. And we really do hope that people, A, enjoyed the interview as a preview of what they can hear at the gala, but that also that they make sure to go your uh, way to the, the website. Can you say the website just one more time? Yeah, so IVHcare.org, IVHcare.org, and then click on the button. It should be the, the gala information, and then you can go there and register and all that good stuff. So well, we appreciate you coming on the show. Bud, to wrap up things, tell folks yeah. where they can uh, when they can pray with us. Please do join us in our prayer life. We pray the rosary on air at 6 a.m. and 10 a.m., the Divine Mercy Chaplet at 2.55 p.m., 
You can also pray the rosary anytime, anywhere using the Iowa Catholic Radio app. And if you want to see other things, of course, the event, you know, we, we hope that you're able to make it uh, to, to the gala. Uh, of course, there's all sorts of events going on uh, in the Diocese of Des Moines in the greater listening area of Iowa Catholic Radio. You can go to iowacatholicradio.com to figure those out. And then not to butt in on donations. You know, we don't want to have dueling banjo uh, nonprofits asking for money. Uh, but Iowa Catholic Radio, of course, is a ministry supported uh, through your good works as well. iowacatholicradio.com, the Iowa Catholic Radio app, or 515-223-1150 to call and uh, talk to people about keeping this ministry alive. This is the Uncommon Good. May Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, reign in our hearts, our families, city, state, nation, solar system, galaxy, the whole kit and caboodle. This is the Uncommon Good, and we'll be back next week. The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr is heard every week on wonderful Catholic stations like this one and anytime on podcast. Just search for The Uncommon Good. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and The Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Learn more at mchs.edu.